Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Steve Kuntiff, who is Professor of Physics and Computer Science at the University of Michigan. His research areas include the use of ultra-fast pulses to study light-matter interactions, as well as their production and manipulation. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with your review article in 2018, Multidimensional Coherent Spectroscopy of Semiconductors, where you say optical multidimensional coherent spectroscopy, uh, MDCS, is a nonlinear spectroscopy technique where a material is excited by a series of laser pulses to produce a spectrum as a function of multiple frequencies. The technique's ability to elucidate uh, excited state structure and interactions has made MDCS a valuable tool in the study of ex- excitons in semiconductors. So before we get into the details of this, Steve, uh, I want to go uh, all the way to the basics. So what exactly is a laser? So a laser, so the acronym laser stands for light amplification from by stimulated emission of radiation. Um, it is a device that produces uh, coherent light um, and also it, in, it produces intense light, uh, much more intense that you get from another source. Uh, the basic principle of a laser is amplification. So simply if you have a medium called the gain medium, that if light passes through it, it comes out stronger than it went in, as in with any amplifier. And also oscillation. So actually a correct acronym would have been light oscillation by stimulated emission of radiation. But if you think about it, you realize why the inventors of the laser did not use that acronym. Um, Because a key thing is, is that you then have a mechanism to feed the light back through that gain medium, which means that the strength builds up and up. So that is the oscillation part. Typically, there is some part of that feedback, which is done by mirrors in a, in a standard sort of tabletop laser. One of those mirrors will transmit some fraction of the light, and that is actually the output. Um, in, in this case, we're talking about making uh, ultra short pulses. I don't know if that word was in there or not, but they're very short. Um, they're actually so short that their duration is less than the round trip time of the laser itself. So that's if you think about it, you have a gain medium between two mirrors, the light's bouncing back and forth between those two mirrors. If you just sort of work the speed of light means that if those mirrors are say 30 centimeters uh, or in archaic units, one foot apart, it actually takes light a nanosecond to go that far. So if you thought about trying to make a pulse just simply by turning the, the laser on and off, you would have to wait a nanosecond for it to possibly turn off for the light to come out. It actually will take longer than that, but you can see that's a minimum. So to make these ultra short pulses, we use something called a mode lock laser, which makes a pulse train based on interference of uh, different what are called modes inside the laser, such that you get a train of pulses, which are much shorter, but there's one pulse uh, 
per round trip time. So in other words, in this case, one pulse per nanosecond would come out of the laser. Yeah, so um, so going back to the, 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 uh, the sort of the garden variety laser, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to produce that, uh, as you say, you need to sort of, um, I don't know if I'm using the right term, reinforce uh, sort of the back and forth movement of light to make it stronger and stronger. So is that the process that we use in, in the typical sort of garden variety laser production? Yeah, so any kind of laser, um, this, the key thing is, is this, the, the last three words of laser, stimulated emission of radiation. So um, if you think about it, it, let's just say the simplest thing would be an atomic system where there's an excited state and a ground state we talk about. Um, and if the electron is in the ground state, if light is incident on it, you can think of it as a photon, it will promote the electron from the ground state to the excited state and the photon will be absorbed. Now, if you can start it with the electron in the excited state, the photon can cause it to undergo what's called a stimulated transition, where it goes from the excited state back to the ground state and emits a photon. And so you then, and you actually end up with basically a copy of the photon that came in. So you had one photon that came in and two come out. So this is an amplification mechanism. So a key thing about a laser is figuring out how to get it that most of the atoms in this case are in the excited state and not the ground state. So that was a key thing that's called a population inversion. And so in the early days of lasers, figuring out how to make that happen was one of the key steps. Yeah, so the medium that you're using, you need the, you need the atoms to be in excited state. Correct. Uh, is it atoms or electrons? So it's, it's actually, we think of it, so the atom is the simplest thing to think about. So we think of it as the electron within the atom. So for example, yeah. let's say we had hydrogen, it would mean that the, the electron is in the 2p state, um, which is the first excited state and not in the 1s state, which is the ground state. Now we don't necessarily need to use atoms. As a matter of fact, most um, uh, lasers don't use like an atomic vapor, which is the kind of the picture there. So it could be um, electrons in a, um, in a solid that are doing this. So for example, the most common laser today is a diode laser, uh, where you would literally, you would actually have the electrons in what's called the conduction band and then make a transition from the conduction band to the valence band. There are also molecular systems. There's, for example, some dyes that work. And again, it's an electron that's in, it's, it's a molecule which is in what's called an electronically excited state and makes a transition back to the electronic ground state. Yeah, so the initial conditions are excited state, photon goes in, it comes back with two. Could you uh, keep repeating that to make it even make it stronger and stronger? So that is actually what you typically do because um, each time you pass through the gain medium, the photons only interact with some subset. There's a probability that this will happen. The probability is typically much less than one. Um, and so you can go back through and try to um, extract more amplification by having it interact with the remaining whatever atoms, molecules that were still in the excited state. Now, of course, at some point you deplete that. And so there's usually a pump. So that's one thing that we talk about is, is a pump, which is pumping energy into that excited, um, into that gain medium to put it in the excited state. Exactly what that pump is depends. Um, ultimately, of course, it's always some form of energy. These days, that's typically electricity. There are actually lasers that work on chemical reactions that you literally start a chemical reaction going around and do it. But most of them, it's ultimately electrons. In the early days of lasers, it would actually, some of them would actually work by running a current through a flash lamp, very similar to the lamp in an old fashioned copier machine, um, which would then excite the material optically. Today, um, the most common thing is actually, uh, again, a diode, a, a semiconductor diode, whether that's a diode laser or a, a light emitting diode. So you're probably aware of the fact that light emitting diodes have become very strong, um, you know, replacing headlights on cars. You can take these light emitting diodes and use them and take the light to excite another medium, which is your lasing medium. Um, in a light emitting diode, it's directly the electric current you apply that actually moves the electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, so then they can make the transition back to the valence band to provide gain. And so to the extent that you keep pumping energy to the medium, is there some sort of a technical limit 
to the, the strength of the laser you can produce by it? So that's a good question, because if you think about it, the way I described it, this would just continue on forever, and basically you would have a, a uh, an infinitely strong beam, which of course yeah. is not going to happen. So yes, it turns out that all lasers work in a regime that's called uh, saturated gain. Um, and so at some point, the light becomes strong enough that it, it basically starts to balance the uh, stimulated emission process with the stimulated absorption process. Mm -hmm. And at that, that point, then you get no net gain. Um, and you don't usually actually work in the case where they balance, but what happens is as the light builds up in the laser, the intensity of the light builds up in the laser, um, you always need to start in a case where the net gain in the lazy me medium is larger than what we call the net loss, which is due to imperfections. It's due to the fact a little bit of the light purposely leaks out. That's our output. Um, it needs to be larger than that, which causes the light to start building up. But as that power builds up, it causes the gain to saturate. And ultimately, it will always saturate at the point where the gain exactly matches the loss per round trip such that such that they balance. So there is a physical process that, that keeps it from going to infinity and blowing up. <laughs> okay. And so so going back to the paper, um, MDCS, optical multidimensional coherence spectroscopy. Uh, spectroscopy is used to really sort of uh, deeply understand the material composition typically, right? Yeah. So typically you think of spectroscopy um, as measuring the frequency components that make up light. And, you know, if you go back to the original spectroscopist, Sir Isaac Newton, he used a prism to look at the different colors that made up sunshine, right? And he discovered, for example, infrared light by discovering that a thermometer off the red end of his spectrum actually heated up. So there he was using that to learn something about the source, okay, in this case, the sun. And so a lot of spectroscopy does that. I mean, quantum mechanics was driven by spectroscopy of atomic vapors of trying to understand these sharp, um, discrete lines they saw. And so in that case, you're sort of using it to study um, something that's emitting light. At the same time, another form of spectroscopy would be to take known light. So for example, coming from a light bulb and pass it through some material and look at what colors get absorbed. And so this is sort of the inverse where, for example, if you passed it through an atomic vapor, you would notice not that there are certain colors being emitted, but there are certain colors being strongly absorbed and not making it through. So there, then you see actually a, uh, the inverse, a, a, a dark line wherever that happens. And that tells you something about the structure of the material. These two techniques can provide similar information, but they can also provide complementary information. For example, there could be situations where you absorb light, but you don't correspondingly emit light because there's some dynamical process going on inside the material that keeps it from re-emitting. You can use this more broadly, not just in atomic vapors, but in solids or in molecular systems to understand um, what sort of the material makeup is. Mm. And, and so, um, so, so this could be used, Steve, for sort of identifying impurities that might be present. So you can use yes, you can use it to identi identify first of all just the basic constituents of something. You can use it to identify impurities. Um, you can also use it uh, to identify um, things like so. If you see an absorption feature, the question of how wide is that? So what spectral range does it cover? tells you information and exactly what it tells you is a slightly subtle question and it depends on on some more things and that's one of the places where mdcs um, helps it can tell you about for example temperature distribution or it can tell you about damping of different kinds collisions that kind of things um, but you can also in some cases get information about dynamics especially in these versions i'm talking about so in other words if you are exciting electrons if the act of absorbing light excite electrons how quickly do they return back to the unexcited state? Yeah, and so so th this term optical multidimensional coherence spectroscopy. So what what is the sort of the differentiating aspects of this? Okay, so this method actually was originally the underlying method sort of the, was originally developed in actually in nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, looking at um, nuclear spins. Um, and 
from a physics point of view, there's a very close analogy between what we do and, and what happens there, even though the frequencies are completely different. Those are radio frequencies that are optical frequencies. Um, but the, the basic, the difference here is, is first of all, I talked about separating out things in terms of different colors, which is a what we would call a spectral picture. Um, in these methods, we typically, don't always, but we typically um, actually take data as a function of time. So in other words, we take a pulse of light and then we either interfere it with another pulse of light or we excite a sample with a sequence of pulses of light. And then we look at how our signals depend on the time between these pulses, um, which you might say is a completely different measurement, but time and frequency are intimately related. You know, of course, frequency is just cycles per second. And there is a numerical technique called a Fourier transform. It's actually a mathematical technique. Mr. Fourier, Monsieur Fourier lived back in the 18th century. He wrote down then what was the integral. Now we can do this very rapidly on, on computers. And so we can take that time domain information and convert it to a spectrum. In other words, figure out what, what combination of sine waves of frequencies make up the given waveform that we observe. Um, and so in the 1960s and 70s, it was realized that um, the power of computers allowed you to take data as a function of time, as originally a technique that's known as Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, and compute from it what the spectrum looks like. So this is an alternative to using something like a prism or a diffraction grating, which disperses wavelengths in space, and therefore you have a mapping from color to space. Here, you take it as a function of time, and then inside the computer, you convert it to um, what the spectrum is. Now, irregardless of what method we use, it turns out that if you do the kind of spectroscopy I've talked about so far, um, there's actually two things that are ambiguous. I've already mentioned one of them, which is that if you look at the width of the resonance, you don't know what it's due to. And so almost always you don't measure a single object, you don't measure a single molecule, a single atom, you measure an ensemble. And the question is, are all members of the ensemble identical in terms of do they have the identical um, center frequency at which they absorb light, or do they have a distribution of frequencies? And so the classic simple example of this is actually, again, a vapor of atoms that are, um, uh, it's a thermal vapor, so they're, they're at some temperature. And some of them will be moving towards you. So they, by the Doppler effect, will be blue shifted. And some of them will be moving to, away from you. And so by the Doppler effect, they're red shifted. And so this gives you a distribution of frequencies. And you'll see that when you measure what that the width looks like. And so that means that um, you're measuring, in that case, a thermal distribution. And you're not measuring anything about the width of the transition of the individual atoms the width of the transition of individual atoms actually tells you something about how that atom is relaxing. So it turns out it's, it's a, what's called a co phase coherence relax. In some case, that can be due to spontaneous emission. So the atom's giving off a photon in relaxing to the ground state, or it could be due to the atom interacting with other atoms through a collision, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the first ambiguity is what is the width due to? The second ambiguity is a little bit less subtle, which is let's say somebody gives a optical spectroscopist a sample and says, you know, tell me what you can using your techniques about this sample. And you observe that there are two resonances, two places in the spectrum where it absorbs light. You immediately don't know whether that is because the sample has um, two species, um, two different types of molecules, two different atoms, something like that, where each one of those absorption features correspond to one of the two species. Or if it's a pure um, sample with only a single species in it, and it has two transitions. So for example, take a simple atom, again, something like hydrogen. Um, it has actually uh, both uh, two different um, angular momentum states in the excited state, a P1 half and a P3 half states, and you have different transitions that are split by what's called the, the fine structure splitting, and so you'll see, see, see two peaks, okay? And so with just simply measuring the uh, standard spectrum in what we call the linear regime, you cannot distinguish these. Now this multidimensional te technique is very good at that. So what it does is it actually measures the spectral information during two different time delays, um, and then correlates them 
uh, by generating what we call a two-dimensional spectrum. Yeah. And you can think of it as the following way. What we're asking is the question is if we, in so we usually call one frequency an absorption frequency. So we say if the system absorbed light at one frequency, can that absorption modify the emission of light at a different frequency, right? Mm -hmm. And so if the answer to that is yes, it immediately solves the question you had before. It tells you that indeed the two resonances you see must be coupled together and therefore they must exist on a single species. Um, that gives rise to what we call an off-diagonal peak because it means that the absorption frequency and the emission frequency are different and they do not lie on the diagonal of the two-dimensional spectrum we generate. Um, similarly, it turns out it also resolves the issue of this difference in the, the broadening mechanisms um, because you actually get a different line shape there. It's a little more subtle effect, a little bit harder to explain, but it turns out we can resolve that as well. So those are the big advantages of this method. The other thing about this method is there's there have been over the years a lot of other methods developed, and you can actually view many different um, spectroscopic methods as being sort of a special case of the multidimensional spectroscopy because we try to gather sort of a complete characterization of the light going in and the light going out such that you can actually reconstruct from the full data set we have it into different sort of projections, we call it, um, which correspond to other methods. So if somebody is particularly familiar with a certain method, you can take the data we have and say, oh, well, this is what your method would look like. Yeah. And so if I understand this, Steve, um, so, so in practice, you have a series of laser pulses on a substrate, let's say semiconductor or something, mm -hmm. um, and and is the is the is the information coming back in reflection or is the inf is the is the laser going through the substrate? Uh, yes, <laughs> both of those. <laughs> um, so it it depends on the configuration. It depends on the sample. So. For example, in this case that we've been talking about here of semiconductors, which are typically physically quite thin, we get an equally good signal backwards in, in sort of a reflected direction as we do forwards. Um, so uh, in, in thicker samples, so for example, the case of an atomic vapor, which is usually like in a, in a, in a cell of some kind, it turns out you don't get as good a signal in reflection most of the time. So there we prefer to work in transmission. Um, so yeah, it depends on, on, on the circumstances depends on the, on the material. So this information then, you could analyze that information and reach some conclusions. Um, and if I understand this correctly, Steve, you know, some information is related to sort of the, the structural features of the substrate, uh, perhaps the lattice structure, some related to different materials being there, perhaps impurities, different species of materials. And so, so if you study this information, there, there's sufficient information there for you to sort of tease out um, the the characteristics of the, the substrate. Yeah, so we can tell, well, it's more than, so substrate usually means something specific to us that that is the sort of starting, um, it's usually a wafer of some kind at which we oh. grow something on. So typically, um, yes, so so often the, the material of interest is not what we'd call the substrate, it would be something that's, that, that's grown on top of it. Um, so for yeah. example, quantum wells, or these days, you know, an example would be um, these so-called transition metal dichotogenites, which are monolayer material similar to graphene, but they are semiconductors. And so, yes, yeah, so you can tell information about the structure of it. You can tell whether or not there's disorder. So not just defects, but actual structural disorder as well. You can also ask questions. So for example, we have some, some recent work that we haven't um, quite published yet, where there's two layers of semiconductors put down on top of each other. And there's a question of if you excite an electron in one layer, can it actually transfer to the other layer? And moreover, can it interact even if it doesn't transfer? And so with these techniques, we can answer that question. We can say whether or not it transfers, how quickly it transfers. And our answer now, which we think is, is a, a new insight, is that actually electrons that are still in the original layer where they were excited by the light are actually interacting with electrons in the other, one, other layer um, in a way that is measurable and important. So, so would you use this in design, Steve? So it, this is sort of a measurement of the status quo of the material. Mm -hmm. So you take a measurement, and if you're looking for features or properties, 
it will tell you uh, sort of how to um, redesign it uh, and, and you iteratively reach an optimum design this way? So yes, it can be used. So, so there's sort of two aspects. So one is there's a lot of interesting just fundamental physics. Um, so it turns out this in, in semiconductors, this gives a lot of insight into what we call many body interactions. So the fact that the electrons and holes interact strongly with each other through the Coulomb interaction, okay. At the same time, it does give insight into, uh, and so, well, let me back up and say, so that information is actually useful from a practical point of view. So again, I, I mentioned that diode lasers are the, one of the most common kind of lasers out there. So it turns out with, with sort of standard diode lasers, if, if you simply take the crystal structure that you design and you try to predict what wavelength of light, so what color will come out, um, you're actually wrong by about 5%. Um, so the color is different from what you expect by about 5%. And that's because that simple, only considering the crystal structure, ignores the fact that in order for this thing to laze, as I said, you need to run an electrical current through it. Um, there's a lot of electrons in there. Those electrons are all strongly charged. They have a, and they interact with each other. And those interactions cause shifts in the energy levels. And so the physics that we probe helps you understand what those um, interactions are. Um, and it avoids if then you can start to incorporate that into a model and it avoids um, the requirement that you uh, sort of do more engineering iterations if you can improve the model so from so at the beginning you get a better estimate as to what's going on um, but as you said so we can also use this to characterize quality and so um, for the our colleagues who are trying to make better semiconductors new semiconductors um, we can give them insight into what is the quality. If they see a certain, you know, line, spectral characteristic, what does that do to? Is it due to disorder? Is it due to defects? Um, or is it just intrinsic? So some of these materials you naturally have very broad lines because of the nature of the interaction of the electrons with light. Is the is the technique and the equipment expensive? Can it be used in sort of a you know uh, garden variety active ingredient uh, purity in a in a pharmaceutical product or something like that? Would it be too expensive? Um, so depends on your scale of expensive. Um, <laughs> so you know the the lasers we use are typically on the order of let's say a hundred thousand dollars for a typical laser although there are for example fiber laser based versions that are uh, less than that they're still you know tens of thousands of dollars um typically uh you know up to now we've we've typically built this on an optical table it looks pretty intimidating to a non-expert actually I am involved in a startup company here in Ann Arbor, which is trying to solve that problem and has developed a, a spectrometer that um, simplifies it. So you still need to have a laser. Um, you know, currently the you know the target would still be a, a research scientist, but um, you put this spectrometer in between the laser and your sample. Um, the spectrometer runs about one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and so you're talking about you know a couple hundred thousand dollars now. That being said, you know, for example, not in pharmaceuticals, uh, we, we're not sure we have an application there yet, but one of the things we're looking at seriously is um, semiconductor industry. And, um, you know, for example, doing defect inspection on, on wafers and things of this nature. Um, you know, there the, the tools on a, f a fab line are a lot more expensive than that. So um, in that case, I think it's an entirely reasonable cost. Now. You know, if you look at the tools on a fab line, they're they're highly engineered. They're they have a lot that go into them to make them, you know, useful for for doing the process control and process analysis that they need. So you know, there's another level beyond that. But I don't think that the sort of the the cost of, if you will, the optical engine that goes in it is actually prohibitive. Yeah, and, and it sounds like to me, uh, Steve, this is uh, fully automatable. I would think, right, because. The uh, the predictability and the and the probabilities that you expect, you can probably sample. You don't have to look at the whole batch, I would imagine. So this could be an automated sort of a diagnostic that could be built. Yeah, I think it, it could be. I mean, you know, right now, a lot of those sort of diagnostics are automated. Um, one of the things that that we've thought about is it does take a certain amount of time to to generate this information. Mm -hmm. But for example, with the same device, we can do much simpler spectroscopies. And so you can imagine a scenario where you sort of do 
wide area, um, if you will, inspection using a simpler one. And then you have a process that says, wait a minute, there's something going on. Let's understand it. And you would zoom in there and then start using more sophisticated techniques to try to do analysis. I think it's my understanding that, that you know, sort of if they see disorder, you know, defect or structural disorder in some of these things, then then they do want to know what's causing it so they can try to figure out how to to solve whatever the problem is in their process and and potentially you can imagine that that working in in this kind of way yeah yeah that sounds promising you, you had another paper in 2018 tricom spectroscopy uh you said current implementations of mdcs require a bulk require bulky equipment and suffer from resolution and acquisition speed limitations that you mentioned that constrain their applications outside the lab. So, so this is uh, sort of making it more practical. So it's making it um, more potentially more practical and um, faster. Um, so the um, the issue is is that most of the techniques we've talked about so far, they actually work in a similar way to the method I called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, which is you need to change the um, time delay between the pulses. And so the simplest way to do that is just simply the speed of light. You simply have the light pulses bounce off a mirror, and then you, under computer control, shift the position of that mirror to make the path longer or shorter. And that way you change the relative delays between two pulses. Um, that works quite well. However, it has um, a couple important limitations. It's hard to do it over a very long range just due to the um, instability of a mechanical device. It's hard to keep that mirror sort of from wobbling as you move it. Um, and it's hard to do it fast. Um, and so some devices, they get big and you, li you literally run into limitations due to the speed of sound. You just can't have this mirror bouncing back and forth faster than the speed of sound um, in whatever you're in, or you gotta start evacuating your device, which is painful. Mm -hmm. So in this trichome spectroscopy paper, what we did is we replaced um, that with a, a different way of generating pulse sequences with delays, which is we have two of these mode lock lasers that I mentioned way at the beginning. So they're generating trains of pulses. And we uh, set them so they have slightly different repetition rates. In other words, the pulses come out with a small difference in the time in between them. So if you think about it, if two pulses at some point line up in time, then there'll be a small delay between the next two pulses that come out of each of the lasers. And then that delay will slowly grow because of this difference in the repetition rate. So what we're getting is this, again, scanning of two pulses through each other, um, but it's sort of, it's incremental in time. So for example, if the round trip time again is one nanosecond, maybe uh, every pulse pair that the relative delay increases by, um, 10 femtoseconds. So femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And so there's sort of like a, almost a magnifier of time going on here. We can use these to now scan these pulses. And the advantage is that you can do it the length of the laser. Okay. And so even though the lasers physically might be as big as that delay line I mentioned about, the big thing is, is it doesn't need to move at all. It just sits there in one place and they, the change in delay happens naturally. You can even imagine it might be a fiber laser. And so you could take those fibers, you can wrap them up in a much smaller box. And so you can literally make a fiber laser that has a equivalent length for the light of a few meters that fits in a box that's only maybe 10 centimeters on a side. Um, but also you can make that scan arbitrarily fast. Well, not quite arbitrarily, but you make it fast by just changing what that difference in the rep rate is. So instead of, you know, having it change 10 femtoseconds every nanosecond, you can make it change 40 femtoseconds every nanosecond. And that allows a, a faster scan. And so the ability to make it longer actually converts to higher spectral resolution. Um, and the ability to do it quickly means we can still do it in a, in a short amount of time. And so this paper sort of demonstrated both of those. It got the, it demonstrated the, the highest spectral resolution. So we're able to see a resolution which is um, on the order of a few hundred megahertz. Um, so that is sort of a radio frequency compared to optical frequencies are hundreds of terahertz. Um, and, but yet it did it in acquisition time of only about a half a second. If you took the more traditional techniques that are based on scanning delay stages, we actually sort of looked at the literature 
and how, you know, based on the, the this connection between resolution and time, because you need to scan further, we estimate that if we use the traditional methods, it would have taken us something like 10,000 seconds to, to get the, realize the equivalent spectral resolution. Mm. So, so it works a bit like uh, sort of error correction, Steve? Do I understand it? Mm, I wouldn't call it error correction, no. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what, what, I, what I'm, what I'm uh, understanding from it is that y you can use this technique to, to really understand what needs to be done to optimize, is it? I mean, to optimize like a sample? Yeah. Yes, you could do that. The, 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 you can do that. I mean, so the trichrome spectroscopy, we were actually somewhat motivated towards, and, and we're still working towards, is a slightly different goal which is not so much semiconductors and materials, but actually um, looking at um, gas sensing and trace gas sensing. And so you can do gas sensing using light. Um, so uh, whether it could be atmospheric gases, you could be looking for um, you know, some kind of threat agent, um, or you could be looking for pollution or just you know, trying to uh, analyze a sample. And so you would typically not do that in the visible and infrared, you typically do that in the, in the mid to far infrared, where a lot of molecules have um, what's called a fingerprint spectrum. So they have a spectrum due to their vibrational modes, um, which is now motion of the of the atoms within the molecule, which is very characteristic of the specific uh, molecule. And even relatively small changes um, can give you a different looking spectrum. And so this has been employed for a long time to try to sort of identify what molecules are present in a sample. Mm. However, it struggles with this issue of a mixture that I talked about before. So if you have a mixture, you basically have to look at a database of known spectra and try to figure out what combination of known spectra can give result, result, result in the measured spectrum, right? Mm. And this is sort of an inversion problem of trying to go through and figure out how that works. It's difficult. It requires some fairly heavy duty software. Um, and it's prone to errors because it could be that, you know, you have a certain number of molecules in your database and you say, well, it's this combination, but yet there's some molecule you don't have in your database that would hap which happens to also match the combination of a couple molecules in your database. So you end up misassigning it in, in a certain way. The advantage of this multidimensional technique is that you basically get rid of that problem because this question of being able to tell that two peaks are coupled to one another allows you to take a spectrum and actually without any external information, without a database, you can uniquely say, this set of peaks must be due to one species, this set of peaks over here must be due to a different species. And so you can sort of decompose that spectrum based on the spectrum alone. And now you have a much simpler problem. You don't need to look at all possible combinations. You can just look at your database. And if there's something that's not in your database, it's clear. This isn't in my database. It's something unknown. Yeah, and, and you can um, presumably build that into, uh, into it, right? So you can do this programmatically. Yes, yeah, so the idea would be that would become, you know, if ultimately to try to do this, that would probably become part of the actual software as it would go in, it would look at the spectrum, it would decompose it, and, and, and you know, ultimately that would be the vision of a, of a useful device is it would say, okay, you know, you have these, these, and these. Now, you need some limitation of the universe of molecules you're looking at. So, I mean, you might, you, you know, an example might be you want to monitor atmospheric gases, then you know what's there, but maybe, you know, you have certain pollutants that might be there and you'd say, here's the, you know, here are the pollutants that we care about and you could identify those. And if there's something else random, you would just say, okay, I don't know what it is, but I know it's there. Right, right. Yeah, so, so I want to finish up with your uh, most recent paper, Steve, a, sim a simple single section diode frequency combs. Um, so you say frequency combs, uh, broadband light sources whose spectra consist of coherent discrete modes have become essential in many fields. Miniaturizing frequency combs would be a significant advance in these fields. So. So, so what's what's special here in this single section diode? So, um, again, this comes back to the discussion we had earlier of of lasers and the different types of lasers. So, the lasers that we've used in all the work I've discussed so far is typically what we'd call a bulk optic laser. So, it's literally something where you have mirrors, you have laser crystals that are mounted um, in mounts that are on, uh, you know. They might be in a box, but they're they're you know sort of 
physically things you can, um, you know, large objects that can move around in space because they're just mechanical things. And that makes them bulky, it makes them expensive, and it makes them, um, you know, sort of not a good candidate for taking out in the field, so to speak. Um, it also makes them inefficient. They typically, they've gotten much better from, you know, over my career, but still they typically require, you know, a significant amount of, of electrical power to run them. Um, so, as I mentioned, a lot of these now actually use a diode laser. So a diode laser is a, is a semiconductor crystal structure that you run current through it and it, and it generates a laser beam. And so you might wonder, well, why do you have all this other stuff when you're starting out with a laser? Why don't you just produce your frequency comb directly from, from that diode laser? And th this is not completely a new idea. People have thought about this for um, quite a long time. And it turns out there's reasons why it's, it was difficult to generate um, a pulse train, which is the way I described a mode lock laser from a diode laser. There, it turns out that the underlying physics of the semiconductor gain medium is quite different from the typical bulk optic um, semi, uh, gain media. So um, it turns out though that to make a frequency comb, you don't actually need a train of pulses. What you need is a waveform that repeats very steadily. So it can be sort of an arbitrary waveform, but then the laser needs to make success, subsequent copies of this that are exactly the same. And so um, this had been discovered as something that can be done in a different kind of diode laser called a quantum cascade laser that works in the infrared. Um, and so people were, had started developing them. Um, to do infrared spectroscopy and they work quite well. However, they're, they're not particularly simple. They, they, because they work in the infrared at what we think of as low photon energy, they typically need to be cryogenically cooled. Um, and they don't work, for example, at wavelengths that um, might be compatible with telecommunications. And so in this paper, we demonstrate that using a quite simple um, diode laser structure uh, that we actually can generate these frequency combs. Um, and it it's actually at a wavelength that's, that's compatible with telecommunications if there's an application there. And by changing the, the structure, we can actually tune it over a wide range. These are efficient. We can actually uh, run them off of batteries. You can almost imagine it's like a laser pointer that actually produces one of these combs. You can imagine, and so actually each chip that we make has multiple uh, individual lasers on it. So one chip you can actually do this, what we call dual comb spectroscopy, which is simpler than a trichrome spectroscopy, but still provides a lot of information. You could do dual comb spectroscopy by running two of these lasers on one chip. And it makes it sort of, um, again, it's it's compact, it's small. It's, it, the, the chip is only um, less than a millimeter in size. And you would need one of these chips, you would need a detector and some computing power to actually generate these. But, you know, example I give you as a wild thing, I don't know why you would want to do this, but I could imagine you could actually, for example, put one of these in your cell phone, okay? So you could actually run around with a small spectrometer. Um, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know why, I don't, don't know why you'd want to do that, but there's definitely ideas of sort of ubiquitous sensing where you could have sensor, for example, you could make a small cell phone sized device that could be monitoring certain atmospheric constituents and you could make that for, you know, a couple hundred dollars and now scatter these widely around and have a much more, um, ubiquitous and, and constant monitoring um, network. So, so, so less energy, um, less bulky, uh, more control, and, and possibly uh, a, a wide variety of applications. If, if yeah. This one, right? yeah. Yeah. So it's just really trying to make spectroscopy ubiquitous is the way I think of it. So. And I was thinking, Steve, um, you, you know, uh, airport, um, uh, scanners, you know, that I mean, we are looking for molecules there too, right? Yes, yeah, so you can imagine uh, that kind of thing where you're looking, you're just constantly monitoring the air, looking for for molecules. Um, you know, people talk about doing breath analysis with systems like this. Um, I'm not sure it's sensitive enough what we have for breath analysis, which typically needs to be quite sensitive. But um, you can imagine that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, th those are those are examples where it could be useful. Yeah, yeah. And so in conclusion, Steve, you, you, your lab is doing a lot of work in this area. Um, you talked about the trichrome spectroscopy. Uh, you have a proof of concept there. Um, we talked about the single section diode frequency comms that seem to have a lot of applications. So if you look forward five years from a practical 
application perspective, um, you know, what do you think uh, is likely to come out uh, to, to actually make a difference in practice? Yes, yeah, so the, the trichome work, what our hope is to try to implement it in the mid and far infrared, as I mentioned, that's the area where we where you have these molecular fingerprints. Um, it's, it's a challenge because the laser sources that work out there, the generate combs are, are not as well developed. They, they're more challenging to work with. And in general, working there is a little bit um, more challenging than working in the, the visible and near infrared where we've worked, worked in the past for a, a lot of practical reasons. Um, but that's, that's one direction. And that, that again is for sort of the chemical sensing applications. There's a, a variety of them that I think would be interesting. Um, you know, with a, the diode lasers, you know, we have a proof of concept, but it'd be interesting to start pushing and, and trying to figure out um, how to make it um, simpler and more robust, um, how to control these lasers better to see what, how, you know, what different wavelengths we can generate with them and identify uh, some, some, you know, sweet spots for trying to develop the applications. Um, I'm also interested, there's a completely different set of applications of frequency combs, which actually was what triggered a lot of the initial work, which has to do with optical frequency metrology and optical atomic clocks um, and, and optical frequency synthesis. And so it would also be interesting to, to work with these diode lasers to see if we can improve their performance to make them applicable to um, those, those applications. So, so you, you think the accuracy of this from an atomic clock perspective could get even better? Well, so the, what the combs do for atomic clocks is they connect different clock frequencies and they collect, connect the optical frequencies to, the, um, to radio frequencies because the current atomic clock is a cesium clock, which is, is, works at radio frequencies. Um, my guess is that for truly pushing those limits, the, the diode laser combs probably are never going to beat the current um, combs. But... I think they do have potential. Um, so for example, there is a certain amount of effort being put into making what's called a chip scale atomic clock. Um, and so the reason for that is, is then you could actually have an atomic clock um, in your computer, or in your car. You might say, why do I need that much accuracy? Well, uh, you actually use atomic clocks every day when you use GPS on your cell phone. Yeah. Um, and if you improve the local clock, um, actually it has a lot of advantages for GPS. And so, I mean, one of the things I can think of is it might be interesting to marry these diode laser combs with some of those to see if we can come up with some improvements there, where again, the, the uh, ultimately, you know, the many, many digits of accuracy they get from atomic clocks isn't needed. What you need is something that um, is, you know, low power and compact and inexpensive. Yeah, so that, that sounds like the general direction uh, of a lot of these things, right? So less expensive, less energy, yep. less bulky, and uh, and that actually opens up a wide variety of applications in the field. Yep, yep. Get them out of the lab into, you know, sort of consumer products. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Steve. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.